ages. It was a time of some pondering. But when you're a February baby up north, winter makes for ponderous birthdays. At 40, though, I was lucky because I no longer lived in Massachusetts. I had my only warm, sunny birth birthdays. And we were living in Austin, Texas. And in February, the blue bonnets are budding and the Indian paintbrushes across the lawn. And suddenly I was saying, I can do my birthday now. It was a glorious day. And at 40, I'd felt like I'd accomplished some things. We'd had all our children. We'd moved several times, and my current job was a really good one. We had a house. We even had two cars. I helped to write the hymn book that you are now using. In fact, I won a prize for a great sermon I preached and got published in a magazine. I was on the way up. At 50, we were in Brooklyn, New York, and had traded the suburban house in Austin, Texas for the three-bedroom apartment in New York City. We had moved only once that time, but we'd gone from two cars down to one, and the first grader in Austin was now a, well, he was a freshman in college in Canada. And the baby born in Texas was pushing puberty. And in those 10 years, no prizes were won, no books were written. And I was wondering what to do. As a boy, I can remember seeing a comment my teacher put on a report card for my parents. Remember when they used to write comments on report cards? And the teacher always wrote in that beautiful Palmer lettering. And it said, Weldon, that's my first name. You can see why I don't use it. <laughs> Weldon is not working up to his potential. <laughs> your, your laughter tells me that you don't recognize this in me so much as perhaps yourself. And I have no doubt that millions of teachers have wrote that same message on them. But I was a kid. And when I read that, my little child's brain had two thoughts at once. I have potential. <laughs> but I don't know what it is. And to my little innocent skull, it seemed that everyone was in on something about me except me. I should be working harder at living up to something, but I had no idea what it was. And I can remember to this day, obviously, feeling a mixture of feelings, pride, confusion, disappointment in myself, even a little shame. What's wrong with me? And a little anger. Why didn't you tell me? I don't know if you remember the Peanuts comic strip as well as I. There will come a day when it will be as ancient as Crazy Cat. You don't even know about Crazy Cat, do you? Oh, I am old. Well, I remember a comic strip in which Charlie Brown was bemoaning the curse of a great potential. And I was looking it up on the internet, could not find it, but I found the wonderful and unnamed blog entry from a woman younger than me. And I, I read this and said, you are a soulmate, whoever you are. She writes, I was feeling depressed because I was in a bookstore filled with literally tens of thousands of books and thinking about my own stalled writing career. I was in the China section reading the back cover of a book by a journalist who was at least five years younger than me, and it said it was his second book. In addition, he was the China correspondent for The New Yorker. Did I mention he was five years younger than me? Have you ever had a moment like that? You don't have to raise your hand. You know who you are. How many of us live with a perverse notion of great expectations, having been saddled with potential up with which you may not be able to keep. Lots of us get drafted into our parents' plans for our future, conscripted into their dreams and estimates. But they never tell us what that plan is. They never tell us what that potential is for. They never tell us how to get there. They just say, we have potential. Or maybe they say, you can be anything you want 
as long as it's some kind of success of which we can be proud. Not a birthday has passed in my life that the shadow of that great potential has not fallen on the reality of my inadequacies and ineptitudes. I have never lived up to my potential. After 60 years, I am not going to. In fact, I had a piece of good luck, grace. That's a good Christian word that means gift. It means something you get that you did not expect, but you got it anyway. You see, my original plan this Sunday was not to talk about my birthday, but to talk about Chinese religion and culture, in part because of the Lunar New Year, in part also because we have several families in the congregation who have adopted children from East Asia, and we have not learned how wonderful that culture has been in gifting us with grace. Well, I was looking here and there into Chinese culture and about the Lunar New Year to find out the spiritual things that go into all those dancers. And I found two things that made me stop. One is what you heard earlier when I talked about the honoring of elders and youngsters. That it is customary, understood, obligatory for elders to receive the respect of their youngers and for the elders then to bestow a gift upon the younger ones. A, a transaction we don't do formally in our culture anymore, do we? Sometimes we don't even see our grandparents or great uncles. I bemoan the fact that my only relative in my parents' generation lives 800 miles away and we can only see them once a year and I'm not doing nearly enough justice to them. The other thing I learned, though, quite incidental, accidentally also, is that in China, birthdays are not customarily observed until you turn 60. And that's because in Chinese culture, if you can make it to 60, you have lived an entire life. They estimate this by saying five times through the zodiac of 12 years. Remember, year of the snake, year of the dog. If you can do that five times, you've lived an entire lifetime. And after that, you're on bonus time. It's gravy. It's all for you. And people celebrate that you made it and that you get another shot. In China and other places, to reach 60 is to be lucky. Unlike here in America, where being 60 means you're too old to do anything in China and other places, 60 is the winner's circle. The late George Carlin once said that young people should hang around old folks so when they got that way, it would be cool. As a minister, I spent a lot of time with old folks. I don't know if that's going to make me cool, but I'll be damned if I'm going to be turned into someone cold right away. Of course, China's not the only place that does that. I always consult the lectionary this time of when, when I think about the sermon. Is there anything happening in the great scriptures of the world? And sure enough, in Paul's letter to the church in Corinth, this Sunday is the one where he talks about love, love is patient, love is kind. It's a beautiful, beautiful passage. And embedded in that, there are some really great words. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became adult, I put an end to childish ways. And he's saying so with pride, with gladness, that the path of faith is to grow up. I was talking to someone the other day about free the mind, grow the soul, and change the world. I said, I can make it simpler. I can do it in six words. You ready? Wake up, grow up, act up. It's the grow up part I want you to lean on today, that it's okay to be a grown up. It's important, in fact, to be a grown up. We live in a world with too many people who don't want to be grown ups because we're afraid of growing old. But growing old is the good part because the alternative is growing dead. And I'm still not there yet. Old is the good stuff. Chinese culture, Paul, they're all telling us that growing up is all right. And what's more, it's filled with benefits if we would let ourselves see it. 
For one thing, at 60, according to Chinese culture, I'm on my second lifetime. I no longer have any potential at all. <laughs> I don't have to live up to anyone's expectations but my own. I get to have new expectations. I am free of that. I can decide what I will be for the rest of my life because I'm on lifetime number two. What should those expectations be, though? It's tough in this culture, and it's hard to be old in this culture. My mother and other elders I've known said, old age is not for sissies. But that's because our culture tells us that being old means being worn out and useless. And that's true if you measure people by how much money they can make in a factory or in a farm. The reality is in America, we value people for how much money they can produce, which is why we don't care about children because they use money, and we don't care about elders because they use money. In America, it's about money. So if